Yeah, Hawaii's role in Indo-Pacific security, really important stuff with some very important people. Um, Susie Vera Slum, she's the president of the East-West Center. That is fantastic. Uh, we know her from many shows here at Think Tech in the past. And Bob Riley, who is the chief operating officer of the East-West Center. But I, I, I need some more for uh, an introduction to Susie, Bob. Can you, can you please introduce her a little bit? I would be happy to. Uh, Susan Varasalam is now the president of East West Center as of January 1st of this year. So it's been about six months, just over six months. Uh, prior to her service at the East West Center, she was a major general in the army and worked extensively at Indo-PACOM. And uh, in fact, I met her at Indo-PACOM when I was the ambassador to the FSM. Uh, and has traveled extensively through, throughout the region and has a lot of knowledge about many of the issues, uh, many of the issues in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. And I'm sure she will be uh, telling you much about that. Thank you. And Susie, just so we know who Bob Riley is, could you give him a brief in introduction to tell us, uh, uh, you know, his background as a COO, uh, Chief Operating Officer of the East West Center? Well, thanks, Jay. I appreciate being on your show again, and I'm very happy to introduce our Chief Operating Officer, Ambassador, former Ambassador to the FSM, Bob Riley, and we are very fortunate to have him. He has an extensive background in the Peace Corps, um, over a decade in the Peace Corps, as well as the Foreign Service in a variety of, of roles including key management, as well as, you know, ultimately becoming an ambassador in the Pacific, where all eyes are on the Pacific. He also has extensive experience in Africa as well, and in, in the Philippines. So worldwide, you could say, and, and also um, at the main state in Washington, D.C. So we're very pleased to have him here as our chief operating officer. What a great team. Oh, exciting. So let's talk about the East-West Center. Um, how do you see it these days? You've been there for a couple of months now, and um, uh, what's what's it look like to you, Susie? You know, it's a place of an incredible legacy. Just uh, in May of this year, it was 62 years since the establishment of the East-West Center when President Eisenhower signed the authorization for the establishment after a lot of work by then Senator Lyndon Johnson in 1959 and then carried on by our own Senator Daniel K. Inouye and Sparky Matsunaga, as well as many other congressional leaders who realized that we needed a place coming out of the ashes of World War II, that we could promote those better relations among people and nations of the United States, Asia, and the Pacific through cooperative study, research, and dialogue. So I want to continue this legacy by building on the amazing 68,000 alumni who are worldwide at 53 locations, doing incredible things, whether they've been heads of state, ambassadors, chief uh, um, entrepreneurs, as well as community leaders that have come out of this program from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. So uh, we're, we, we are embarking on a strategic plan right now that should be out, our foundational plan at the middle of this month, actually, uh, to look at where we want to go for the next 10 years. Wow, fabulous. And it also has a, a tremendous connection with Hawaii, going back to the, quote, friends of the East-West Center. Uh, my wife spent many, many happy hours with people in the, in the center uh, in, the, in many years ago, but uh, as, as part of that organization, and that represents the connection between the East-West Center and Hawaii, you know? That's absolutely right. In fact, you know, as they were considering with Governor Burns back then in the 1960s, where to have it, it was clear that Hawaii um, should be that place, being that we're in the middle of the Pacific. We have uh, our host, Kanaka Maoli, Native Hawaiian community and values that can be a, a connector of the East and West. And we have the multicultural nature of Hawaii. So it made sense that Hawaii would be the place. And we're happy to say we have a Washington DC office now that connects us to the rest of the United States. Um, so it's, it's, it's fantastic. And I'm grateful for your wife and the many others who have helped uh, many generations of East West Center fellows and participants coming through here as sponsors and supporters. Tremendous. I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting this patriotic feeling. 
That always happens right around July 4th. <laughs> so, Bob Riley, can you talk about the conference that was only, what, a week ago at the East-West Center? This was a very important conference, and uh, Maria Reza appeared. It was for yes. media journalists and, and graduates of the East-West Center. That's really uh, an enormous event. Can you talk about it? It was a tremendous event, and, uh, you know, it was our first in-person conferences in Hawaii. Uh, since before COVID and since early 2020. And, uh, you know, it, it's like that that intervening period never happened. Our folks did a tremendous job. It was an amazing, con both conferences were amazing, just incredibly well realized. And uh, it was a major achievement. They worked very, very hard and uh, the uh, with a limited staff at that and uh, really brought off an amazing conference. As you said, Maria Ressa was there, but many other uh, notable and distinguished journalists were there as well. And, uh, you know, there James Stewart from, not, uh, I'm sorry, James Stewart, James, anyway, there was, there are not, a, a very important VOA journalist was there, as many other journalists were there, and it was, it was, they had not much to say, and it was extremely valuable, I think, to all who attended. And uh, I certainly came out learning a lot, and then the alumni conference was was very inspiring. You know, these as as Susie mentioned, there are some almost seventy thousand alumni of the East West Center, and uh, many of them came to the to the alumni conference, and it was inspiring to hear what they had to say about the East West Center. So all in all, it was it was a tremendous thing. Jay, can I can I butt in a little bit? Of course. <laughs> I wanted to expound on what um, Ambassador Riley said. Is you know we had journalists, over 300 in person and many more online um, that came from 35 countries. And these are not just beginning journalists. Many of them are editors or bureau chiefs. So like the uh, US bureau chief for Straight Times, Nirmal Ghosh, who, um, you know, he's based in Washington, DC, but came out here or Kitty Pilgrim, also East West Center alum. Uh, CNN, Lou Dobbs, you know, evening report for 25 years and authors. Those are just samplings of some of the amazing journalists who were here. In addition to Maria Ressa, we had a uh, representation from Meta. So, you know, having journalists who were here who said, who were alumni and said, you know, before we used to be able to um, control the content and distribution. Now we're relying on, on, um, virtual platforms like Facebook who have a responsibility to ensure that it's, it's distributed in the right way. But I'm, I apologize. I, I just needed to share that bit of information. So no, thanks. no, no. I want to pursue that a little bit, though. Um, you mentioned early that, um, you know, part of the role of the East-West Center is to bring the East and the West together. No surprise, just listening to the name of the center. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> part of that is to, is to get the word out to get the word out to the East, to get the word out to the West, to have conferences, just like the one that Bob described last week. Um, and, and so my question to you is, how, how do you do that? How do you bring the East and the West together? How do you get the word out through the media and otherwise uh, in order to send the right message to both sides? Well, Jay, you know, I, I wanna share, first of all, what we're trying to do is share our vision is that the East West Center over the next 10 years and beyond in collaboration with many, many partners, because to do this as, as Bob mentioned, required many partners, whether it's Congress, state, uh, other countries, other like institutions around the world, we wanna be a premier institution or catalyst in the Indo-Pacific for convening, developing and equipping a network of leaders to solve those challenges of common concern, whether it's the environment or governance or uh, you know, the, the challenges in economy. And we believe that we can do this by number one, being that place that equips and develops those leaders from the United States, Asia, and the Pacific, bringing them together. That's what's unique. That's what's different than a Fulbright scholar. scholar. That's what's different than a university. We are intentionally bringing them together in this building that was built by IMP, which is, um, the Hale Manoa here, uh, designed specifically to uh, create inclusion. The second thing is that we want to convene impactful dialogues. So whether it's the Pacific Islands Conference of Leaders, this international media conference, alumni conference, Pacific Islands Forum Working Group, or 
ASEAN working groups, or as we've seen APEC or the Conservation Congress, we need to continue. You know, once the APEC happened in 2011, what next? After this happened this week, what next? We got to continue to make sure that we're sharing our voice. The other strategic priorities we have are, are, are this. First of all, we want to continue to partner with the Pacific, that the Pacific Islands is the Pico. And Ambassador Riley would tell you that having been ambassador there in Micronesia, that we see um, amazing um, voices in the Pacific that need to be heard. And we believe we have a role in that. We also want to foster environmental solutions. That is increasingly important as we see the impacts of climate change in the Pacific and also in the Indo-Pacific and the world. And the last area, of course, is supporting good governance. We see what happens when we lack good governance, you know, uh, irresponsible investments in, in economic um, or infrastructure or, or you know, um, blocking media openness and transparency, uh, poor decision making that affects and impacts the people in the region. So those areas are of increasing importance. Uh, throughout the world. And I believe that the East-West Center has a key role in helping equipping those leaders so that they can solve those problems and challenges. Yes, yes, amen to that. Um, Bob, you have been um, through the, the diplomatic uh, service, you have been to a lot of these places in the Pacific Islands and around the Pacific. Can you talk about how the East-West Center reaches or wants to reach those places and how, as Susie said, it, it wants to help them environmentally. Well, I, I think uh, as when I was the U.S. ambassador to the Federated States of Micronesia, we had quite a few uh, programs through the East-West Center, and we we interacted directly with those folks. Uh, there, there was a there was a there a number of leader uh, leadership training programs, uh, students who went through the scholarship program at the East-West Center. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think what we're doing now is actually we're broad uh, the scope. And now we have, for example, we have uh, a, a large program under the auspices of USAID and SPC, uh, Project Governance, uh, which, is, which has its intent to, to promote good governance throughout the Pacific. And uh, this is a, a this is a huge project by USAID. It's probably the largest that they've ever done in the Pacific, and we're involved in that. And uh, and that's 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 a, a small amount of what we're doing. I think we're also very much involved in the environment. Climate change is a huge part of what we do. Uh, we have a, a RESA program, and we have a, a Green Climate Fund program, uh, which we're actualizing throughout the Asia Pacific region. And uh, these are programs that RISA has been ongoing for quite a while, uh, but uh, the this new green climate project is new, and we're just now starting to embark on. And uh, these are these are going to reach many countries, many Pacific Island countries uh, around the region. You know, Susie, this reminds me of um, a show we had with APCSS. Um, where it came clear that um, not only did they want to establish better relations with these various countries in Indo-Pacific, but they wanted the countries of Indo-Pacific to establish better relations with each other. And so they would throw them together um, and they would try to make them, you know, friends and so forth. And it strikes me from what you and Bob are saying that that's part of the East-West Center mission also. It's not only to bring the East and the West together, is to bring the elements of the Pacific together so they know each other, so they can cooperate and collaborate and be friends. Am I right? That's exactly right, Jay. And we just do it in a different manner. You know, we're, we have long-term graduate fellowships. So they actually live here. It's residential program where, you know, whether it's uh, South Pacific scholars, where it's an undergraduate degree, but most are graduate masters and PhDs. So they're there's a part of the programmatic where they're here long term, um, and and they're put about one third of the student body are from the United States, and so for many throughout the United States, it's their first time in one place, uh, meeting many from the Asia Pacific um, and showing why Asia matters for America and why America matters for Asia. 
which by the way, is a series that the East West Center in coordination with other partners put out. So you can find that as Asia Matters um, for America.org. And, and those are, we do it by country. The most recent, by the way, has been the Philippines. We also have shorter term programs, whether it's the Jefferson Fellows, which is a premier program for emerging journalists throughout the world. And we saw that at the International Media Conference or the Pacific Islands Leader Program or the Asia uh, Pacific Leadership Program. The young Southeast Asian leaders were just here and those Waisili um, fellows came and all 20 of them, this was their first time to the United States, it was here. Um, so we're, we're investing in the young leaders and that's where, um, and then mid, mid leaders for the professionals program. And also not just here in Hawaii, but also in Washington, DC, where we have the congressional leaders program and the young professionals program that also is funded through other countries as well. And the difference as well is our funding is congressionally funded going through the state department, but the other part of our funding comes from generous donors who have left um, an amazing mark throughout generations, as well as other organizations to help fund scholarships, which are very much in need. If I, just to give you an example, the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Program, we had 20 here, 15,000 applied for that program. We have 300, we had 318 South Pacific scholars apply for the graduate, graduate programs here. Um, our the State Department allocates only three. So only three were able to come. So when we look at opportunities that Asia Pacific Islanders would like to have here in the United States through here, they go to the University of Hawaii and participate in our program and live here on our campus at the East West Center. Um, there's much need. And we're so grateful to be able to put this information out to find more people who are willing to support young leaders and invest in their future. Yeah, it's so important. I would, I I would add uh, just to uh, just to your point that uh, we bring uh, other countries together. We are also a crop agency of the Pacific Islands Forum through the Pacific Islands Development Program, and this program unites all twenty of the Pacific entities, not just countries but also uh, uh, territories and even the state of Hawaii. Uh, and it's the only organization that does that. And so as such, we, we also are sponsoring, we sponsor the Pacific Islands Conference of Leaders. And uh, this is, this is a, a huge event that we have, we're going to have an event uh, sometime this year, very soon. And it's going to be a major event, which will involve the heads of states of, of, of most of those entities uh, in person. And I think we'll have a hybrid version too, for those who cannot come. So, uh, that is that is very much a way of bringing all of the, the various uh, states, territories, uh, countries together uh, in the Pacific. Yeah, that's really interesting. I was going to ask you about um, you know heads of state and whether you might get them here, and um, you know why not APEC before twenty one years. APEC uh, at, at uh, 10 years, for example, <laughs> and why not have it at, uh, and you are having it effectively. Um, and, and I think diplomacy, let me ask you this, Susie, diplomacy has changed as it changed in your program last week by being hybrid. And a lot of these conferences you guys are talking about are now gonna be hybrid and COVID has changed the way diplomacy works, am I right? Absolutely. We, we need to provide for and be sensitive to um, Pacific Island nations, especially where medical capacity is not there. And in times of a pandemic, I, it's very clear that ability to come, uh, you know, into another space that might make you more vulnerable, we have to provide this. In the past, someone might have said, there's no way you could do this virtually. Now it is acceptable. And I think it's a wonderful way to get the information out. And in fact, we can touch more people in terms of being able to connect more frequently and have meetings where we would have to wait. So the communication, I think, um, is much more open and uh, it, it's very exciting to, you know, to have this capability. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, it's leverage. Um, but, um, you know, what about the public, Bob? Can, <laughs> was the public generally invited to the conference last week? Will the public be uh, have access to the East-West Center now? 
Um, will the public be invited? Will the public be able to attend classes and be part of the process now? Uh, well, the public was was allowed to to attend the conferences last week. Certainly, the I am the international media conference was was open to the public. Uh, there was a fee uh, to to attend, um, and I think we did have quite a few people from outside the media who who were there, uh, and that was quite exciting to see them. I think it really was it helped to spread the word. Um, in regards to opening up the, the East West Center itself to the public. Uh, we're open. We're open now. Uh, we, we, we've opened, been open since March. And uh, we, uh, uh, you know, people just uh, enter and then they register as a guest. And then you know, usually you have to have a sponsor, but not always if you have a good reason to be there. There's a, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the receptionist will route you to the right place. Um, but um, that's, it's, we're open there as well. And uh, in terms of the uh, the classes, uh, actually, I think those classes are really in UH. We do not actually have classes. Those are uh, University of Hawaii classes that they attend, but we have our separate East-West Center program uh, within our, our, our premises. Uh, and uh, together, uh, students from a variety of different uh, countries, as Susan, Susie mentioned, uh, come together eat together, uh, live together, and uh, get to know many different cultures. And it really is something that, that they remember for the rest of their lives. And, and we have a very loyal alumni base uh, that, uh, that uh, comes from that. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and that were, that's why there were so many alumni at the uh, alumni conference. Jay, can, oh, I, uh, please. Can, I, can I add um, to that? So we do also, by the way, have an arts program that we don't talk about as much. That arts program is pretty deep and that is open to the public. We have an arts right now, it's Pacific. So we will be uh, part of the Pacific Festival of the Pacific in 2024. Um, and Aaron Salah, Dr. Aaron Salah is uh, also an adjunct fellow here at the East West Center and also the director of that fest. Um, and this uh, display, the, the um, exhibition has to do with the last Pacific, Festival of the Pacific in Guam. And, and we th that's open to the public. They can come and enjoy that as well. And all of the seminars that are advertised, if you go to our East West Center website and sign up for all of the seminars, wonderful dialogues on whether it's uh, Korea or Trilat or uh, environmental issues in the region, anyone can sign up for those. So I recommend that people go to our East West Center re website and sign up for those, you know, uh, early um, um, registration. And as well as I mentioned that many of our publications are accessible to on that website as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I, I, I think it's important that people in Hawaii, people who are here, people who are coming through here um, should understand Hawaii's role in Asia Pacific and Indo-Pacific. And you, you are an expression of that role. Um, and so it's important that they have, you know, they learn from you. Um, we, we have to teach people in Hawaii what it means to be uh, the connector in the East and the West. You know, you mentioned before that you had fundraising activities going on. And I recall this would be around the time that, that uh, Hillary Clinton visited the East West Center uh, when she was Secretary of State. Um, and I recall that she she was there. I can remember her her comments and all. And in, in those days, it was a challenge to get funding. And I wonder if that challenge has, has I mean, federal funding. If that if those um, that challenge has been met, uh, I wonder how you're doing in terms of uh, federal support. Well, I'll, I. I can tell you, we're really pleased at our Hawaii delegation. They have been so supportive and as well as the US Congress. Um, you know, we just did a congressional round table last week with our Senate and House, uh, myself and our vice president in DC presented. And it was very clear that um, our Congress is very supportive. So we're um, really proud that most of our funding comes from Congress and the US government. However, when we talk about those 
uh, investments in student programs and scholarships, we look to a lot of private funders for that so that we can expand that number that I gave you. Um, Cause you know, our, our US Congress is supporting the programs and the center itself, but we do need to match that with other private donors. But Bob, maybe you can chime in a little bit about our latest good news from Representative Case and, um, and support for Senator Schatz and Hirono and as well as Haika Hele. Yes, indeed. Uh, you know, it was, it was very good news to hear uh, just last week that uh, the House uh, Appropriations Committee has increased our, our federal budget from a 19.7 million level this year to 21 million next year. And I know that uh, Senator Schatz and Senator Hirono are also very supportive of our program and are, are trying to uh, ensure that that level is at that, at that increased level or higher. Uh, so we'll see how that comes out. You know, they, have, they have many, many uh, uh, budget battles to go through. It's not an easy process. It's uh, definitely sausage making. So uh, it, it's, it will it remain, you know, it's not a certainty, but it's certainly a great sign and certainly indicative of the incredible support we get from the Hawaii delegation for which we are very, very grateful. I can only see that as getting better and better because I know, <clears throat> Susie, how you present. Mm -hmm. And I know, I know how persuasive you are. <laughs> could I just say a quick <laughs> word about that? <laughs> she, you, she would never say this about herself, but Susie brings dynamism, energy, empathy, and vision. I mean, honestly, she's just, just the right person uh, for the East West Center. Uh, at this critical period. And I think we're gonna see some real real success in the future. Yes, you wanna to respond to that or should I go on to the next question? Bob is so kind and I really <laughs> appreciate that. I couldn't do it without him, without an amazing staff. You, the, if you would have seen the passion last week and Bob can attest to this, I mean, everyone, all hands on deck to make it happen. And it was incredible. So I'm just grateful for, to be part of this team. And we are grateful to have you, Susie, honestly. So let me, uh, let me ask you my, my, my last area of inquiry, if you don't mind. So the East West Center is, is uh, in many ways a diplomatic organization. And um, you know, it's got an interest in uh, expressing American influence and power um, through Asia Pacific, through Indo-Pacific and, and making sure that everybody likes us, okay? <laughs> At the same time, we have China, China is a very complicated place, and it you know it uh, it has it's very um, ambitious, and uh, sometimes aggressive, and uh, that that's got to be on your radar. Uh, and I and I wonder you know what the dynamic what what dynamic you see going forward in terms of uh, American presence in Indo Pacific in Asia Pacific, uh, and what what role the East West Center would play uh, in dealing with the expression of American influence there. Thanks, Jay. You know, I think the environment has changed and we, we've had actually many Chinese students. So I think we are, East West Center is a place where everyone can come together to find out where our mutual interests lay and also areas that we need to work out. Um, it, it is a trusted, they use the word neutral, but you know, it's very difficult to be neutral sometimes. I mean, you, you want to be neutral, but it's a trusted space, an open space where we have multiple perspectives. And that includes, you know, we have uh, extensive Chinese alumni who, who also have been through these programs um, that continue to be very active. And we also have regional leaders who say, you know, help us to build capacity in our economy, in our healthcare, in our students, in our, um, give us, uh, you know, options and, and relationships and not put us in a position where we have to choose. And I think that's where East West Center can come in to, to lay everything on the table, to talk about where our interests meet and where we can help each other to make people's lives better. Because really the focus here is people to people, nation to nation, caring about one another. And I think that's where the East West Center needs to focus. Amen, amen. Bob, you're probably going to agree, huh? I absolutely agree. I mean, it's, it is a real <laughs> challenge to to uh, maintain our, our traditional stance of neutrality and dialogue in this very competitive environment. But I think we can meet that challenge. In fact, we are, we are meeting that challenge. Oh, fantastic. 
So what are the next steps going forward, uh, Susie? What, what's going to happen first and how you see all of, all of this uh, unfolding for you? Well, by the end of uh, this month, we will have our foundational strategic plan on those priority areas I talked about, whether it's leaders, convening, Pacific, environment and governance, and looking at strategies and programs that meet those needs, not just it going beyond the, the, the understanding, which is critical, but also giving, uh, equipping leaders to be able to have the financial media literacy and economic entrepreneurship, the connections, understanding where the grants sit so they can make lives better for their, the people in their countries. So um, that's where we're going next. Also building more relationships, going out to share the story of the East West Center and where we wanna go next and bringing people along to ride this wave with us. That's exactly where we need to go, in my opinion. Uh, we have to, you know, there's, as I mentioned, there's a certain amount of, you know, geopolitical contention, um, but you have to, you have to have friends and that's people to people. And that serves a tremendously important role uh, in, 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 in the Pacific and in Indo-Pacific. Well, thank you, Susie. We wish you all the best. Um, make a special blessing. I'm making a special blessing on you now. Okay, see, see the way I do that. Uh, and Bob, you too, Bob. <laughs> and I wish you well, you guys. You're a great team and you've been great on this program. And I hope we get to see you again soon. Suzanne Varis Lum, President of the East West Center, and Bob Riley, Chief Operating Officer of the East West Center. What an honor it is to have you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.